Suspense. From Hollywood, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, and its producer, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. Good evening. Tonight, we have taken a page from Collier's magazine. Several pages, in fact. A story called Where the Warriors Crossed by William Eastlake. We have added the chants of Navajo Indians and the histrionic talents of Reed Hadley. And then, for reasons which are not entirely captious, we have changed the title. But the story is substantially the same, designed to be uneasily remembered long after the next 30 minutes have ended. A story of a tormented mind and a proud tradition. We begin now as Reed Hadley stars in Red Cloud Mesa, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. between Cayenta and Ship Rock. So high the clouds catch on it sometimes. Red clouds if the sun is rising or setting. Red Cloud Mesa. where the wheel tracks snake across the reservation from Gallup is the Red Cloud Trading Post. I'm the trader. One white man amongst thousands of Indians. Lonely? Yeah, sometimes. But I like it. I think of the Navajos as my people. They think of me as their friend. That's the way it's always been with us. I was born here. I grew up here. Today, I nearly died here. I've been expecting you, Four Thumbs. You're my prisoner, Captain. That the same gun you killed the guard with? How did you know? The radio's full of it. How you shot your way out of the psychiatric ward of the Veterans Hospital. How you, you believe everything you hear on the radio and read in the newspapers? Most everything. You'd believe them before you'd believe a man who served under you? A man that was in your outfit in France? In this case, yes. For an Indian, a quiet, padded cell is no place to die. It's no place for anyone to die. Then you won't turn me in, Captain? Can't do anything else. Unless you leave. I've got no place to leave to, Captain. That's why I come here. I counted on you to help me. You always have. Have I? Yes. In the bows that time, when my platoon was cut off for six days, you got through with help just in time. I couldn't have lasted a minute longer. I got through a day too late. You crazy? Look, Captain. I'm here. I'm alive. Believe me, you got through just in time. One, maybe two days too late. I'm sorry. What you sorry for? I'm alive. Yes, alive. You was alive when I got to him. That day in the bows. The only one left alive. He was giving orders to a platoon of dead men and carrying the orders out himself. It must have been like that for his forefathers who defended this final mesa here against the white man a hundred years ago. Like them, he didn't know how to say surrender. He only knew that the mesa, this position somewhere on the flank of Estonia, must be held. He didn't know that his mind must be held also. And after the sixth day of the enemy breakthrough, after six days of the water, he didn't notice that his mind had deserted the action and left his body all alone defending the position. Give me that gun. You'll hide me? I don't know yet. Give me the gun and unlock the door. No, I won't let them take me. That's an order, Corporal. You're back in my outfit. Now I take all the responsibility and I give all the orders. Give me your gun. 
Yes, sir. Thank you. Now, please open the door. Yes, Captain. You heard the news, Mr. Bowman. What news? That psycho from Window Rock broke out, killed a man, and ditched his car in the Shawili. They figure he's headed this way. I heard. We better be ready. We are ready. Rabbit stockings, I want you to meet one of us. One of us? One of us, I want you to meet rabbit stockings. Yate, one of us. Yate, rabbit stockings. If he is headed this way, Mr. Bowman, I could begin to put my knowledge into motion. Rabbit stockings is referring to the correspondence course he's taking to learn to be an FBI man. I am also taking a course in bodybuilding, pedicure, and diesel engines. Why? Because I I don't want to be a dumb Indian all my life. I want to have a white man's diploma in something. I think you're crazy. Would you care to look at my latest men wanted bulletins? No. This, this, the truck is coming. Not a diesel. A gasoline driven truck. I can tell by the sound. Looks like old man McGurry's pickup. Captain. Maybe you'd better let Rabbit Stocking show you his FBI lesson, one of us. Yes, sir. Come then. Because you are Mr. Bowman's friend, I will show you the secret place where I hide my white man's knowledge from the dumb Indians. I still think you're crazy. Go out the back way. Yes, sir. That was old man McGurry's pickup, all right. But it carried a passenger, a passenger I was expecting. State Trooper Arturo Trujillo, who was responsible to the citizens of New Mexico for keeping the peace in a thousand square miles of Indian and white man's land. He was in old man McGurry's pickup because the state took a dim view of buying him a new front end for his black and white patrol car every time he had to chase an Indian through the back country. What is this, George? Oh, hi, Arturo. What's new? Uh, we got Indian trouble. Give me a pack of cigarettes and a candy bar. Yeah. There you are. Thanks. I'm supposed to be watching my figure, but they say this is quick energy. How's the wife? Well, she's watching her figure. And McGurry's boy, he's still watching her figure? Not anymore, he ain't. I had a talk with him the other night, out of uniform. Uh-huh. Where are you hiding the Indian? Oh, that's why I pay my taxes, to pay you to find out where they hide. New Mexico don't collect enough taxes for that. We need your help. Don't ask me any questions, Arturo. Just don't ask me any questions. Okay. But don't make me look bad. Ever been in a padded cell, Arturo? Oh, me? You think I'm crazy or something? No, of course not. But take a look out that front window. I've seen the view before. Looking out there, you'd think this Navajo land went on forever. On and on from one blue range of mountains to the next. Can you imagine an Indian born out here dying in a padded cell? Okay, George. Just don't make me look bad. That's all. Promise you won't make me look bad. Promise me you won't try to be a hero? Listen, you've got 60,000 Indians on this reservation. Think I want to be a hero with those kind of odds? I like to come home nights in one piece. <laughs> I don't blame you. You have a very attractive wife. Here, take her some of these candy bars. My compliments. <laughs> All this time, I never suspected you. <laughs> well, you should spend more time at home, Arturo. I know. That's where I'm going now. But first, I got to take a look around. Got to make a report. Don't forget, I got a citizen outside. Old man McGurry. I got to go through the motion. I'll send Yellow Salt for someone to show you around. What can Yellow Salt do? You don't understand these people, Arturo. Yellow Salt is an elder. So he squats on the trading post porch all day while his wife herds the sheep. It is the privilege of an elder. <laughs> Wish I knew their secret. They'd I could get an honest day's work out of my wife. <laughs> I'll be right back. Ahalani. Nazoni. Ahalani, San Sierra. The ending of the day finds you well, Yellowstone? Well enough. But I have been asking myself a question. Oh, what is the question, brother? Perhaps I can help find an answer. It is this, San Sierra. What is the cop doing here? He's perfectly safe. He's got to make a report. We don't want to make him look bad. 
Thank fear, this presents another question. What is it he doesn't want to look bad about? That psycho boy, Four Thumbs. He escaped and killed a man. The cop has orders to look for him. They want to put him back in a padded cell. Then really, Sancia, what can I do not to help? Why, really not to help? Go find me a boy named one of us, who is with rabbit stocking, so he can show this officer around so that this officer can make out a report and not look so bad that they will send someone else who is thinking in terms of heroic action. Or worse, someone who is sincere. As you say, then, I will do my very best not to help, since this officer is not sincere. You know where Rabbit Stockings hides his white man's lesson. Everybody knows. In that little cave where the petrified tree rolled off the edge of Black Canyon. Everybody knows? Even so, only Rabbit Stockings does not know that everybody knows. So he still has his secret. My thanks go with you, brother. It is an honor to be able not to help the police. Someone will be here to show you around in a few minutes, Arturo. Thanks, Josh. I just want to look. You know, I don't want to look bad, you know? Don't worry, you won't look bad. I always uh, get the feeling that these Indians of yours don't trust me. And they don't trust sincere people. Are you sincere, Arturo? Huh? I don't get you. Well, the Navajos feel that their nation has been cheated out of almost everything they ever owned by sincere people. You know, I think they have a point there. It looks like you don't trust them. What do you mean? How come you got this carbine leaning against the shotgun? Hey, watch out, it's loaded. But why? Well, I don't know, really. I live with that gun from Red Beach to the Rhine. Sort of became a part of me. I just feel better having it around. Better or more sincere, George? In just a moment, we return to tonight's tale of... I'd like to say a few words to you servicemen and women who are bed patients in Army, Navy, or Air Force hospitals. There's a good way and a profitable one you can spend your time while you're recuperating. And that's by enrolling for a USAPI course. Not only can you take one of more than 340 courses offered by USAPI, but the Institute has also prepared a list of some 40 educational manuals covering a variety of subjects, from the mechanics of English and the study of our American government to the management of a poultry farm and the running of a variety store. You'll find any one of the 40 microfilms interesting and of great value to your future. For a uniform education, study with USAPI. And now, we continue with Red Cloud Mesa, starring Reed Hadley, a tale well calculated to keep you in... foolish I was. But at the time, I was seduced by the delicious irony of the situation. What less sincere way to make state trooper Trujillo not look bad than to have the man he was hunting show him around? I thought I was thinking as a Navajo thing. I should have realized that this is as impossible as it would be for rabbit stockings to think as a white man thinks. It is very dark in here, rabbit stocking. It should be. The sun has not warmed this earth for 60 million years. I have a candle somewhere. Ah, here it is. What is this talk of 60 million years? Look about you. The roots of the ancient tree turned to stone. When the tree at last rolled into the canyon, it left this cave where its roots had been for 60 million years. Where did you hear this child's story? Mr. Bowman told me. The Sancia says it is science. See this rock? He says it's called petrified wood. The Sancia is crazy. All white men are crazy. Crazy enough to own the world. Crazy enough to herd all the dumb Indians onto reservations. You want to be a dumb Indian all your life. 
Don't you want to have a white man's diploma in something? No, because I'm not crazy. I just cannot believe that one does not seek to better oneself. Listen. You learn every word in those lessons. You think any white man will give you a job? They used to say the only good Indian is a dead Indian. Now they change it a little. They say the only good Indian is a dumb Indian, a blanket Indian. But you see, next time they go crazy, next time they start fighting, they'll change again. Then they'll say the only good Indian is the Indian who fights for his country. And they'll take you out and teach you to kill and kill and kill. They teach you so good, they get hurt feelings when you can't forget how to kill. We are a peaceful people, one of us. Not everyone is like that crazy psycho Indian from Window Rock who shot his way out of the I will kill you, <laughs> rabbit stocking. Put down that rock. Petrified woods, you said it was. A piece of the sound sea is phony tree that is hard enough and sharp enough to smash your crazy head. I do not understand. I meant nothing by what I said. You said too much, rabbit stockings. You think this cave has been here for 60 million years? Very well. You shall remain in it for another 60 million. No, no, don't. Look, oh, sir. Huh? I'll take that rock. I didn't hear you behind me. I didn't mean that you should. It is an interesting rock. See how it glints in the candlelight? But some see as 60 million years. It, it's difficult for even an Indian to believe. Some see as crazy. Of course. You saved my life, Yellowstone. He's crazy, too. Of course. The Sun Seer wants you back at the post. But he just sent me up here. Your name is one of us, is it not? No. Four thumbs. Four thumbs? I thought so. Come, the Sun Seer is waiting. In the back room of the trading post, Ben Yarsey, the silversmith, was singing as he hammered away at a turquoise studded gate hole. Then a couple of women wandered into the store, carrying their babies wrapped on cradle boards. Silently, they unlivered the cradle boards and stacked their babies upright against the wall. Silently, they squatted beside them, never taking their eyes from Arturo Trujillo, the uniform symbol of white man's authority. A little later, old man Tornface slipped in without a word, his toothless mouth twisted into a permanent grin by a long-ago kick of a forgotten pony. Then a couple of dirty-faced kids with scraggly, uncombed hair. And they sat there, all of them, wordless. They make me nervous, George. Tell them to get out. They belong here, Arturo. You don't. You're making me look bad in front of them, George. What do you care, just so you don't look bad in front of the white men and Gallup? All right, George. All right. He turned his back on his silent audience, stamped out his cigarette, and began to build a pyramid with the candy bars I had given him for his wife. He worked at his pointless task with such intensity that sweat stood out in the afternoon stubble on his jaw. There was no sound now. It was silent inside the storeroom, silent as death. Outside, silence too, save for the Albuquerque plane far off. And closer, a fly buzzing on the screen door. The pyramid was finished all but the capstone. Arturo carefully raised the final candy bar. Hey, what's the big idea? You made me wreck it. You're crazy. What did you say? I said you're crazy. Want to make something of it? I was just having some fun. Arturo, this is one of us. He'll show you around. Don't bother. I guess I've been here long enough to make a report. Old man McGurry is getting impatient. Anything you say, Arturo? Don't forget what you promised, George. Oh, I won't, Arturo. What did you promise, Ancia? You double-crossed me? No, one of us. I promised him that you would not get caught by somebody else in his territory. And that you would always be a good soldier and not cause any more trouble so you would not die in a padded cell. Uh, 
Why did you send for me to show him around? If you showed him around, then he could not find you hiding, could he? No, Captain. You will go back now to Rabbit Stockings Cave. You will stay there until it is safe for you to take a hogan. Yes, Captain. Say, George, I forgot. Hey, you crazy Indian, put down the... Hold on. Cease fire! George! I only come back for the candy. Four thumbs stood at attention, eyes straight ahead. State Trooper Trujillo lay in the doorway, one boot holding the screen ajar. Lay very still. A buzzing fly eagerly circled a trickle of blood that oozed across the floor. One of the babies wailed in fright. And the chant began. The chant of the enemy way. The chant that would protect the people from molestation by the ghost of this foreigner. I think you and I had better go up on the mesa, Corporal. Yes, Captain. But, yes? Beg pardon, sir, but I thought I was to go back to the cave. A new situation has developed since then. It is necessary to change the order. Yes, sir. Or... Oh! yellow horizon as we started up the narrow trail along the face of the main line. Already that giant red fist had snatched a streamer of cloud which floated wistfully toward where night crouched darkening blue in the east. We climbed silently, steadily, ten, fifteen minutes, upward across the sheer face of the cliff, four thumbs holding the proper combat patrol distance ten yards behind me, steadily, up, always up toward the gathering clouds, now orange with the dying sun. Captain. Yes, Corporal? I've still got the carbine. I had forgotten. Forgotten completely. I turned slowly, erect, trying to look like a CEO in my cowhide jacket and Levi's. Yes, he still had the gun. A Section 8 psycho who was also a combat infantryman still had the gun and still held his prescribed position ten yards behind me. Well, I should hope so, Corporal. A man isn't much good on a patrol without a gun. Yes, sir. The trail was narrower now as it approached the switchback. Six hundred feet up the sheer cliff wall from the desert floor. And above, the clouds were thicker in the mesa's fist. All orange now, deep orange. Yes, Corporal. Ever hear of an officer being shot in the back by one of his own men? We were close to the clouds now. It was chill on the mesa, but I began to sweat. Suddenly, explicably. And the sweat was not warm. Oh, you hear stories like that from time to time, back of the lines. Up front? Well, I suppose it depends on what kind of a leader a man is. Yes, Captain. We were clambering over boulders now. The great rocks that Four Thumbs' forefathers had rolled down for the mesa top, thinking to keep the white man away forever. They almost did. But defending this final fort, the top of this dry mesa, 200 feet above us in the clouds, they ran out of water. No one quit. They were still up there. And then we were at the switchback. And a moment later, we were in the cloud. A red cloud now, where the misty blood of the day's death surrounded us, cold, damp. The ghost stuff of the ancient warriors whose bones still lay above us. And their voices, too, it seemed, pressing on us in the clammy cloud. Take five, Corporal. Yes, sir. I stopped and leaned back against the cliff wall. The trail was only a foot wide here. Out beyond the red mist, I waited. And 
Only knew his coming by the sound of his footfalls until all at once he materialized beside me. He leaned back, too, careful to keep the carbine on his right side, the side away from me. I heard plenty of stories like that overseas, Captain. Oh, I dare say it's happened. More than once. Any leader takes a chance. That's one of the risks of leadership. In combat, when a man's head races with blood, when it's kill or be killed, sure, it could happen, but... But what, sir? Well, when... When a soldier comes back out of the lines. When a soldier is back in the rear area and safe and begins to kill his own outfit. And there's nothing anyone can do to help him. Help? That's what I said. No longer any help for him. Then it's up to the soldier himself, if he isn't crazy, to figure out a way of saving the outfit he's destroyed. Yes, sir. We're cut off completely up here, Corporal. You can do anything you want with the rest of the outfit. You've got the gun. Yes, Captain. never saw your carbine leaning against the counter some few years. And you never will again, Rabbit Stockings. I'd expect a dumb Indian to bury a man's weapon with him, but not a white man. It was a valuable gun. My people believe a man is more valuable. And we respect your ancient customs. Thank you. And thank your people. It must have been quite a climb carrying his body all the way to the top of the mesa. That's where he belonged. Up there with the other warriors. And those old people. Cut off up there without water. They must have gone crazy. Before they died. Probably. But they stuck it out. When they could have quit. Yes, they did. And he was their son. <laughs> with Miss Sarah Churchill in Charles Dickens' tale of terror, The Signalman, a story well calculated to keep you in suspense. Suspense is produced and directed in Hollywood by William N. Robeson. Red Cloud Mesa was adapted by Mr. Robeson from the Collier's Magazine story, Where the Warriors Crossed by William Eastlake.